Raw milk is a polarizing and controversial topic that uh, actually surprised me quite a bit, but as I dove into trying to understand the pros and cons to it, Mark McAfee came to my attention and he is an absolute force when it comes to raw dairy and understands it in ways that is extremely deep. So we dive into the topic and he lays out his thoughts and it's a really, really great conversation. Mark, I'm uh, so excited to be visiting with you, brother. Uh, you are a force uh, to reckon with, that is for sure. And I have thoroughly enjoyed going over um, just kind of the interviews that you've done. I recently put out through, I own a farmer's market, a uh, just kind of a post asking what the the audience's thoughts were around raw milk. And I was blown away with the the take overwhelmingly positive, but then there was, you know, obviously some, some, you know, backlash there, but something I was very surprised about were that the small dairies were very, um, passionate. Let's just say that and not necessarily a positive passionate about the conversation. And so I was curious to get into that, but before we just take that deep dive, uh, can you introduce uh, yourself and, and how you got into being such an advocate for raw milk? Well, my, my name is Mark McAfee. I'm the owner and founder of Raw Farm, which is the largest raw milk dairy in the world. It's located in Fresno, California. Um, I'm also the chairman and founder of the Raw Milk Institute, which is a nonprofit, not, or it's rawmilkinstitute.org, was founded back in 2012 to help farmers around the world uh, produce raw milk for human consumption, not for the processor. That's a huge piece of work to talk about uh, because the standards that are used for processing are completely different. And I agree that milk should be processed. But the standards you use when you produce milk for, for human consumption are entirely different different sanitary uh, objectives, different practices, different testing, different everything. So that's a really important thing. Um, the way I got into this was interesting. I spent 17 years as a certified paramedic. I taught paramedic medicine, 24-hour uh, shifts on a helicopter. I was on a rescue team. I recruited paramedics. I taught paramedic medicine at the health department. <clears throat> I precepted. I did everything you can imagine in paramedic medicine for 17 years. 15,000 paramedic calls. I mean, it was intense. Not a lot of sleep and a lot of sick people, let's put it that way. In 1996, um, I retired from that, and my grandparents and my parents gave us a 1,000 acres of ground, my brothers and I, and um, I did not want to get on the conventional roller coaster of commodity markets and serving processors. I had decided that I was going to make a difference and be different, literally different, by serving people, not processors. And that was a seminal foundational change and pathway to where we are today. And so in 1996, by 1998, we'd established uh, Organic Pastures Dairy, which is now Raw Farm. And um, we did a bunch of research. We went to the LA farmer's markets. We talked to, to people that were there saying, what would you like in food products? And we realized what was missing, which was raw milk, even though it's legal in California, a large raw milk producer at the time called Altadena, which was in Los Angeles, had gone out of business. They'd sold to Dean's Foods and the owners, the Stubies, had left with millions of dollars in their pockets to do other things. So uh, we decided that there was a vacuum to be filled. People wanted raw milk. Uh, they wanted it from a farmer they could trust. They wanted it to be safe. They wanted cows to be on pastures. They want all kinds of cool stuff. And we put that into our farm plan. And here we are. Um, 24 years later, highly successful uh, in over about 2,000 uh, 2, stores nationally with our pet food products, our cheese products, and then in California, about 550 stores with our raw dairy products. All, everything's raw, but in California, we're, we're, we're kept from going across state lines by the FDA. We, we can't take fluid milk over state lines. Uh, so that stays inside California, but we have a pet food product line approved by the FDA. We have raw cheeses that go to all stores across America. So that's where we are today. My son and daughter are very much involved. 
My son is the, he has his master's degree and he's bilingual and he runs the operations and he's a great guy. His name's Aaron. My daughter has a degree in marketing and she uh, does all of our social platform work, which is incredibly, um, a lot of influencers connected to us. And so we, we capitalize on the fact that our message triggers someone who really is passionate like yourself. And what you find is they may have 50, 100,000, a million followers. We've got Danica Patrick, who's a race car driver. We've got uh, David Carr, who's a football player. We've got um, Tori Spelling, a famous foot, uh, you know, movie star. We've got all these people uh, that, that support us because we support their families. And their families love our raw milk and what it does for their gut microbiome and their health. And so they want other people to know that. So it's really a really cool free exchange of information on these social platforms that has driven our message of gut healing. The gut microbiome and raw milk are fantastic partners. And uh, raw milk is the first food of life. It builds an immune system that did not exist before birth. Um, it's a powerful food and has filled with all kinds of, of bioactive components that are destroyed by pasteurization. So the key to producing raw milk is you use different practices, different testing, because you have a different customer. You're, you're taking care of a peop, the people versus a processor. And that brings tremendous value to the farmer and to the consumer. And the reason you have upset or confused or somehow upset small dairymen about raw milk is very simple. They are getting screwed over right now, like you can't believe, by the processing industry. And we're losing five and a half dairies every day in America. In California, we're, we're losing a dairy a week. So last year, we lost 2,000 dairies in America. We're down to about 23,000 dairies or so, something like that. Um, in 1982, we had 130,000 dairies. So, or, excuse me, 1992. So tremendous decline in the interest of pasteurized milk. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in plant-based milk, although that kind of leveled off. Incredible interest growing in the popularity of raw milk because it's the real deal. It's been around for 15,000 years in terms of raw milk from other consumer, other mammals. But it's been around for God knows, count your numbers, hundreds of thousands of years as far as breastfeeding is concerned for us and our babies as mammals, as humans. So it's tried and true God's blueprint, uh, Mother Nature's blueprint food that's incredibly powerful. We could talk about that. But the reason we have problems with small dairies being jealous is they've been trained forever that the milk they produce should be processed. And I will agree with them. It should be because of the practices and standards they use. It should go on to be processed because it's packed filled with pathogens most of the time. The studies yeah. are very clear on that. And pathogens so can make some people sick. Mark, but before before we get into that, because I think that's a super important topic. Um, I, I spent eight years on an ambulance, so we've, we've got that EMS, uh, you know, background, that parallel there. But uh, what do you think that the EMS experience helped you with as far as uh, prepping you for for the business of, of interacting with consumers and customers? Why, why do you think and how do you think that has impacted you? As you know, Jordan, um, you're not a very good medic if you don't have compassion. You have to be that, not the police officer that's standing back with a gun or whatever. You've got to be that human concept, that humanity that touches people saying, you're going to be okay today. And we're going to work together to make sure you survive, right? Yeah. And you're going to bring in every breathing circulation and all the other stuff you got to do, defibrillation, intubation, you, you name it, in your drug box. And, and But you've got to have compassion. You've got to care. You've got to make people feel welcomed and comfortable and safe. Well, that's something I did and something you did, the ambulance, and uh, wherever you were as a first responder in 911. And when you do that, you feel humanity. You yeah. feel people scared. You feel illness. You feel that people are expressing, I've got diabetes. I have seizures. I have hypertension. I'm giving birth to a baby. I'm having chest pain. I can't breathe. I'm choking. Uh, you do something about that as a paramedic. You mm -hmm. intervene in their lives and make a difference. And the family cries because you were a hero. So that is something that really drives to the soul of the human being. And as you know, I'm sure you felt this too, or you wouldn't have done it. But I know I felt compelled to serve and compelled to make a difference. And that really comes into the second chapter of my life where 
gosh, I can redirect people's lives where they don't get diabetes and they, they, they get their asthma. It gets better because their gut microbiome inflammation decreases in their lives and all these things. It's like, wow, you know, how, what a great way to have a second chapter in life. The first one was intervening in acute care. And the second one is, wow, preventing. So you don't need acute care. What a phenomenal farmers over pharmacies kind of concept. So that's kind of what compelled me because I felt humanity and I visited it and I saw it and I experienced it. I think when, when you can see and experience the end results of a lifetime of decisions that have wrecked your health, uh, it, it makes this side of it a lot easier, right? And so the, the other aspect of that, Mark, was that uh, my oldest, so I've got four kids, but my oldest was diagnosed stage four cancer when he was five. Ouch. And so that that gut punch is exactly you know why I, we have a podcast and why we do these kinds of uh, conversations is because of trying to find these answers and how how can we apply things uh, how can we share things that others can apply if they want to right not not forcing anything down down anybody's throat but you know Lander he, he's now it's been five years he's doing great uh, but I'm not able to turn it off. And so uh, in that post that I had mentioned earlier with with Facebook and Raw Milk, uh, you know, one of our followers actually recommended that I reach out to you and get you on the podcast. So the your to your point on the social media, it is a community of uh, bringing awareness and strengthening those relationships. So a, as we go into that, why why milk? Why is milk of these proper properties for, you know, optimal health because as as you're aware, in the, the alternative world, more of the holistic, uh, dairy can get poo pooed on pretty pretty heavy, right? They uh, and in the anti cancer world, it's always avoid dairy, avoid dairy, avoid dairy. And so, I think there's probably more to it, right? So, do you care to go into why is raw dairy different, and why does it have these health promoting factors? That is a fantastic question, and I'm going to give you a lot of credit because you're the first one to ever ask me that question um, in, in that way in terms of, of – I, I take that back. You're the second person. Uh, Season Johnson. Uh, Season Johnson lives down in Tulum, Mexico, near Cancun right now. And she had a, her son, a kicker, who had cancer at four years old, way before she ever any, knew anything about raw milk. And when he went in for cancer treatment, his doctor – uh, put him on chemo and this and that and the other thing, but they also prescribed antibiotics. Yeah. And he, Season did a lot of work, and she realized that many of the people that were treated for cancer did not die from the cancer, but died from the treatment for the cancer because it compromised their immune systems to the point where they would get some other unassociated uh, illness, an infection, and they didn't have a immune system to be able to fight it off because the chemo had compromised their immune system and the gut microbiome was shot. And you have to all remember, this is a key takeaway, that at least 80% of your immune system is the gut microbiome. It's living bacteria, the diversity, the many different kinds of bacteria and the colonies that they produce and the environment they live in and the food they eat. Those two things create an environment which is literally 80% of your immune system as a functioning, healthy human being. When you have chemo, it may very well be life-saving. I'm not anti-chemo. I'm not anti-therapy for particular cancers. But what I am anti is compromising your immune system so you die from other things. So there's kind of a, a, comp, a, a, a balance between using modern medicine to save your life and using complementary medicine or nutritional medicine, deep nutrition, to keep you from dying from the treatment you're getting. Right. <laughs> And Susan Johnson goes into this great work that she's done. And it's very interesting that when she took her son, kick her to the therapy, he didn't lose his hair. He didn't, uh, he wasn't uh, looking like he was ready to die in the waiting room. He was thriving and doing great. And his indicators of immune function were very high. And the doctors were turning up the chemo more and more and more because it's not working. It's not working when, in fact, it was working very well. It's just his body was not becoming compromised in the face of this onslaught. So nutrition and support of the gut microbiome during therapies, whatever therapy that might be, is absolutely critical to thriving through cancer to achieve dominance and getting rid of it. Letting your body heal itself and, and, and get rid of what's going on. 
And that's a very generic approach to this thing. I'm not getting particular specific here, but that was something that she discovered. Now, in my work with the International Milk Genomics Consortium, I'm the only farmer that, it, that goes to these conferences. There's maybe 100 to 125 PhDs in the room, and they're talking about breast milk. And I, I just got back from Cork, Ireland a few months ago, where, where I was the only farmer in the room again. Uh, I've gone for 12 years. And there are so many bioactive elements found in raw milk, and in breast milk, and in mammals' milk. They're uncounted. There's like 2,500 that they've been able to figure out so far, but they find more and more all the time. And all of these are either denatured, inactivated, or destroyed in heat pasteurization. Some of these are very anti-inflammatory. Some of these are bacteria. Some of these are all kinds of stuff. There's, there's proteins, peptidases, which are enzymes, which help actually digest the proteins. So uh, there's, there's bacteria that create lactase for you, so you don't have lactose intolerance. But there's just some... Just, incredible amount of bioactive activity in raw milk. So when you have those bioactive activities, that bio, those bioactive active things interact with your gut, interact with you. And you can do some little work here to really appreciate this in much more detail by reading up and understanding what the, the Human Genome Project was in 2001, which was discovered. It was several billion dollars spent by the Department of Energy. And what they were trying to do is figure out What's the effect of radiation on soldiers, sailors, on uh, nuclear uh, subs? What was going on with radiation when they're standing next to radioactors down a thousand feet underwater in the middle of the ocean for months on end? And what they found was they were looking for the human genome. What makes us genetically human? And this really pertains to this conversation a lot because what they found was there's 23,000 genes, 23 and me, that you get from mom and dad. It makes you look like the way you are. That's the hard drive that makes you look the way you are inherited from mom and dad. That's the hard drive. The soft drive, the software that drives us is biological and bacterial. And so literally 90 to 95%, they're still arguing over this, of, of the genes that we have in and on us that drive our genome to function properly are bacterial that were brought from our our, our ecosystems from our mom and dad through the birth canal, through breastfeeding, through kissing, hugging, the environment we're in and the, and the food we eat and the bacterial, the bacteria that inhabit us in, in us and on us. And they, those bacteria swap their genes, move their genes, their genetics, their DNA back and forth between our human genes and the bacterial genes all the time. And they complete our microbiome. Without that, you become immune compromised and all kinds of crazy stuff happens. Our bodies become too clean and they overreact and start attacking our cells. So it's really critical that we have this biodiversity and these immune uh, system products, the, the antibodies and everything else uh, in and on us and in our gut interacting with us to be complete and healthy. The, the, le the leading theory on how cancer begins is that something called an emerging stem cell that is not differentiated. In other words, you have new cells being produced and instead of them getting good information about what they're supposed to do and behave themselves and become a hair follicle or become whatever it is in your body they're supposed to become, they don't have the genomic information or it's confusing information and they do something they're not supposed to do. And so uh, it's very, very important to have them receive that genomic information when they emerge so they differentiate and become what they're supposed to become. And that's the leading concept. I'm, I'm sure they're going to figure out more about that whole thing because they really haven't figured it out completely. But most scientists agree that that's what causes the beginning. Why that occurs is still a little bit of a challenge, but they know that bacterial DNA plays a very big part in differentiation of stem cells, so they actually become what they're supposed to become. So that leads us to a, an idea that's very interesting. If you think about blue zones around the world, blue zones are where people live to be 80, 90, 100 years old without disease um, and do very, very well. Uh, they eat whole food nutrition. And they also expose themselves to a broad biodiversity of bacteria and don't have a lot of contact with antibiotics. So not that antibiotics are bad, they're life-saving, but they also compromise your immune systems. You have to restore yourself after you have them or else you have all kinds of challenges. We have to remember that the first forms of life on earth, uh, tipping my hat a little bit to religion here, but in the science side, is that we, the first forms of life on earth were archaea bacteria. And archaea bacteria is the stem of what began life uh, on the surface of earth and grew from the oceans and so on and so forth. Those bacteria still live in our guts today. And so we really have to have a little bit of a deeper appreciation for the fact that we are bacteriosapiens. 
that in fact we are driven by the bacteria and probably some viruses as well, uh, the virome as well as the, the microbiome that actually drive our genomics to be healthy humans. So that said, um, we have to really kind of embrace whole food nutrition and biodiversity in our gut um, to be healthy. Yeah. To, to, to kind of circle back on what, what you said, as, as we have dove into the cancer topic you know, heavily, um, I, I firmly believe it's a, it's a metabolic uh, initiation. I think the mitochondria is messed up. And to your point on the whole bacterial side, if the, the you know, mitochondria are indeed more bacteria than they are human cells, that, that also makes sense, right? And then, so when we, we look at that whole realm, I think that it's, uh, you know, we got Otto Warburg that's been saying this for over 100 years as far as how the cells produce energy. And if that is correct, uh, th that leads into the deeper of what, what you're just saying. But the biggest question that I am trying to sort out is the safety of raw milk for the immunocompromised, right? And how do we gauge that? How do we look at it? You know, because I get contacted, Mark, on the daily with some new cancer diagnosis or somebody going through cancer and just asking for guidance. And honestly, I've been hesitant to recommend raw milk for anybody that is, is even remotely immunocompromised. And, and for, you know, full transparency, my son had no dairy whatsoever during his, uh, you know, journey of, of undergoing treatment. So how do we gauge that? How do we know which way to even consider in an immunocompromised person? I think you're absolutely right. I agree with you. If you were to have a virulent pathogen enter your body during a period where you have immune compromise, you could die. I'm the first one to ag agree with that. I want to um, talk a little bit about the standards intended for human consumption versus processors. When you produce milk for processing under the pasteurized milk ordinance of the FDA, and the state agencies would pretty much embrace that. Um, anything goes. It's coming out of the cow, a little bit of manure, unhealthy cow, it all goes. And by the way, it gets combined with all the other dairies doing exactly the same thing. So standards are really, really loose. They don't ever count pathogens like Listeria, E. coli 0157 STEC. A salmonella, a campylobacter, those are never calculated or even talked about in raw milk for pasteurization because the pasteurizer, most all the time, it, it works very well. It kills them all. But here's the thing. When you have a really high load of bacterial waste in the milk, when milk comes out of a clean udder from a healthy cow, very low bacteria count, but a diversity of it with all these bioactives. But when you have it contaminated with all these components that happen from 25 dairies all combined together. And then you go to process that milk. What happens is a process called lysing. You actually tell a cell, take a cell body, you break the cell body open with heat, 145 degrees at 30 minutes, all the way up to 280 degrees, depending on the pasteurization step you're using. It's called a five log kill step. And the bacteria are literally blown apart and the internal uh, workings of the bacteria, all the DNA, the, the microchondria, everything in there, the cell bodies are just released in the environment of the milk. Your body, when it consumes that milk, sees, my God, all this bacterial waste it becomes very allergic. Your body says, get rid of that. Create mucus, get rid of it, get rid of it. There's nothing alive, everything is dead. So it is uh, very likely to trigger an allergic response or histamine response and congestion which is not what you want for somebody who's going through chemo or going through cancer treatment ever. It's not helpful. So um, instead of doing that, what we're talking about is raw milk intended for human consumption, which is tested to make sure that it's clean and safe and all these kinds of things. And when you have something that's extremely bioactive with all these immune system supporting components that are alive and well, and all the bacteria are alive and well, and the bacteria you have are bifidobacteria, lactobacillus bacteria. These are extremely powerful immune system supporting uh, bacteria, which are alive and well. Then it's an entirely different dialogue. What you're doing is you're bringing on all kinds of probiotic, prebiotic, and postbiotic things that will help you. Now, a lot of people don't know what postbiotic is, but I can kind of explain. Prebiotics are the food that bacteria eat. 
Probiotics are the diversity of bacteria themselves. And postbiotic is kind of the bacterial poop. They're the metabolites created by the bacteria eating food. And those metabolites are the building blocks that your body needs badly to build things and heal things and create things. So bacteria are, are, are little, little worker bees in our bodies that keep us well and get rid of and suppress bad bacteria as well. They outcompete them when they're doing well. So I would agree with you 100% that you would not want to consume a pathogen filled or even pathogen tainted uh, raw milk because in a compromised immune system state, that could make you sick. I entirely agree. That's why the Raw Milk Institute was established 12 years ago to train farmers on how to produce raw milk from healthy cows in a very sanitary way. So you have that milk that's created very in a sanitary way, but then also tested to assure that you do not have, or extremely rare that you would ever have, a pathogen. And as a result, we see people thriving on raw milk from that different kind of raw milk. Now, I will go one step farther. I'm a big, huge believer in raw milk kefir, K-E-F-I-R. It's fermented raw milk. It's a low acid. It's maybe uh, 3.8 to 4.1. Most of the times at 3.7, 3.8 uh, uh, pH. So it's acidic. It's also pre-digested. It's got, it's teeming with good beneficial bacteria, maybe uh, 12 to 15 million per milliliter. So it's like yogurt. But instead of having four or five different kinds of bacteria on top of a pasteurized base, it's a living base of all these bioactives we're talking about, plus perhaps 120 to 150 or even more diversity of bacteria at extremely high levels. And it, it's easy to digest because it's already fermented. So it's kind of like a sour a yogurt kind of a thing, but it's a fantastic base for a smoothie. So you put it into a, a blender and you add in all the, ki all the things the kids love. Berries, antioxidant berries, blueberries, raspberries, bananas, even a raw egg, um, if you want to do that. Um, avocado, uh, some raw honey. And you don't really want to have a lot of sugar in someone with, with cancer because sugar can drive cancer. But certainly a whole good, uh, slightly sweet will give the energy that you need when you're also in cancer as well. So you would use a good um, low glycemic index food like like a whole a wonderful raw uh, honey, along with these other uh, self-sweetened things like berries and bananas and things like that. Plus, uh, avocado is fantastic with its good fats and the good fat from the whole milk, whole milk, which is fermented already. And you get this delicious smoothie, which is a fantastic gut regeneration food, along with bone broths and other things that you would do to get that gut to not be leaky anymore and have the, the mucosal lining rebuilt, all kinds of great things happening so that your gut is actually working like it's supposed to in the face of the onslaught of things like uh, chemotherapy or even antibiotics. So, uh, you know, a lot of the therapies we have nowadays and some of the therapies are getting pretty good. Uh, other therapies are getting even better and using all kinds of genomics and all kinds of cool things as well, uh, making custom antibodies and really cool things. But they work pretty well, but they're also very destructive because it, it's like kill it all and hopefully you emerge from the ashes surviving. Yeah. That's kind of the way they do about doing it. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very deep topic that uh, it, it can get very complicated, especially as you throw in all the, the different opinions to, to go back to your lysis. I think that that is a very important aspect that uh, needs to be, you know, maybe discussed a little bit more. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Gonzalez was pretty, pretty good at showing that when he was using pancreatic enzymes to treat cancer. And so by killing the cancer too fast, it was causing lysis uh, poisoning to where that's where he started incorporating like coffee enemas and how do you detox and, and the same thing with chemo, right? If we kill the cancer too fast, we poison the body based yes. off of the dead cancer, right? The toxins exactly. of relief that are contained in that. And so, you know, there's a lot of theories behind cancer, what it really is. I think that we have a lot to figure out, but I, I find that very fascinating and it made me understand it uh, more. As you said that the problems with pasteurized milk, it makes perfect sense, really. So um, my big takeaway from what you just said is I think that the alternative cancer practitioners and worlds are spot on that they need to avoid pasteurized dairy wholeheartedly. Yes, 100%. Um, and, and I think you laid out that argument very well on that is an allergenic food. It is causing a mucosal buildup. And there's a lot of things that it's not helping with. And so 
this is where, Mark, I get a little frustrated when we're talking to oncologists and they sit there and say nutrition doesn't matter. And it does, you know, they look me in the face, right? And they said, I, I said, what, you know, I'm, I was terrified. I had EMS experience, but that, that doesn't prepare you for a cancer diagnosis of your child. And so what do we do? What do I feed them? What do I not feed them? It doesn't matter. Well, I now know that that's not true. And as I've watched so many babies die, because I'm, I'm much more in the pediatric side on, you know, the passion with my son, but still very exposed to cancer all the way around. It's infuriating. Uh, and that's why I feel like it's so important to continue to have these conversations and to understand it. I was like, I have no agenda. What is going to make people better? What's going to heal my son and give him an optimal life to overcome the things that he was exposed to? So, with that said, how can we ensure the safe raw milk in regards to legislation? And that is something that I just applaud you. You could say, you know, uh, forget the rest of the world. I'm going to focus on my business, build up my business as successful as I want. I don't care what anybody else does. You very well could do that, right? Yeah. But you have spent so much time and effort and money to build out a institution that trains other people to 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 be a uh, a delegate in absolutely going for changing the world and legislation in our country so how do we implement for arkansas it's a little tricky you got to buy directly from a farm and, and it can be very inconvenient how do we create this blueprint to get more places that can pass easy legislation that's safe well i don't think legislation is easy it's one of the hardest things you can do because there's so much money involved in keeping the status quo, the status quo. And the processors do not want raw milk going from the, for the farmer to a consumer directly and bypassing them. Uh, it's considered rogue milk. It's out of control. It's not in their control. And um, where we've seen raw milk thrive, California is one place where it's just dominating the marketplace. 50% um, growth two years in a row, 50% then another 50% two years in a row post COVID. Uh, where we are literally dominating the marketplace uh, in, the, in the dairy case. That's a very big threat to those that Absolutely. want to keep the established uh, status quo. So what I found works best, and this is a long, this is a long road, is to build a market and you don't sell raw milk, you teach it. You teach raw milk. You teach about the gut microbiome. You teach about the role of good bacteria. You teach about enzymes. You talk about whole food nutrition. You talk about prevention of cancer. You talk about the complementary means of treating cancer when necessary, the best of modern medicine, and combined with the best of gut microbiome and deep nutrition together. So you're not just hitting it with, with whatever you're doing in modern medicine, but you're also hitting it with all the blueprints of life behind it. So you have the best of both worlds to thrive. And that's why I'm a huge supporter of Susan Johnson's work uh, that she's done. And she did nonprofit work for 10 years on this. That's been very, very well received by moms that have seen their children do very, very well for the most time. I mean, there's been a few ch children that have been lost. and It's horrendously heart-wrenching to see that. But at the same time, we've seen so many children thrive through this experience where you're doing deep nutrition and gut microbiome work. At the same time, you're using the best of modern medicine. So those things seem to be working really, really well together because we know what kinds of modern uh, kinds of modern medicine work well. And then we also the studies show us that. But then we also know what helps us not support the growth of, of, of a cancer and support support the growth of being able to get rid of the toxins created by the therapies and actually be able to thrive through it. So your body can have a fighting chance to not get sick from some other uh, pathogen that comes along from whatever the common cold can get you. So uh, the advice I would give on changing the law locally is get a couple of farmers to really, really do a great job of producing excellent quality raw milk. And I would recommend they becoming listed by the Raw Milk Institute. We've got 45 farmers in America that have been listed, which is a certification. They submit their bacteria counts uh, frequently, uh, multiple times per week or even month, depending on if they have arm farm labs or not. And their consumers thrive. It's a long shelf life product of 21 days. It's delicious. Uh, it does not contain pathogens because we test for the environment that we create those and the sanitary conditions. Um, and, and that is the basis for a new wave of understanding raw milk. Because if we embrace the raw milk right now that processors want, I have to agree with the legislation. If they say, we don't want that kind of stuff. It's gonna kill people. I would agree. 
So I'm the first one to agree that we need to have different kinds of practices where we have sanitary conditions and healthy cows and environment that works in rapid chilling and testing. And that creates a safer product. And we can actually then go to the legislature and say, we want this food. It's not an easy thing to do, but at the same time, it's possible. So, Mark, with that said, the way Arkansas is set up is you can buy directly from a farm, right? Yep. Directly, directly from them. And then there's no nothing, really no other way of, of, of securing raw dairy in Arkansas. Right. So how important is that partnership that, say, you have had with, with Sprouts? How important is it to do it the right way in partnership with retail and marketers? Well, there are many, many places across America where you cannot get raw milk from a store. Every state has their own law. Arkansas has either cow share or direct to farm kind of operations. California, uh, you have the retail environment. So we have that special relationship. We also have special relationships with customers here. But I, I think that it is critical and I cannot overemphasize, it is essential and critical that the farmer and the consumer have a relationship and there's full transparency of what the farmer is doing. And the consumer has to understand the language of what it is they're looking for. What kind of practices, what kind of shelf life, what kind of testing, what kind of things make that raw milk good for them? And also good for the farmer too. The farmer's not gonna be in business very long if he makes people sick. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you wanna have Mark, a thriving something farm. Happens. Please. It cut us off. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Can you start back? At the, at the retail? Yes. It's very, very important. It's critically important that consumers and farmers have a direct relationship when you don't have a store relationship. Even in the store relationship, we have a direct consumer relationship because we, we keep that content up on the social platforms. We answer questions. We have farm tours. But when you don't have that and you have farm direct only, it can almost be better because you know the farmer, you know his practices, you know what he does, his personality, his ethical and moral concern for you. And you can ask hard questions. You just have to be educated as consumers what questions to ask. That's why the Raw Milk Institute was founded was to bring those buried pieces of data that you would never know to the surface. So the consumers can see what the farmer's doing and see their bacteria counts and explain Raw Milk to them. Again, we believe in teaching Raw Milk, not selling it. Raw milk will sell itself when it's fully explained and people understand what it is. So it's very, very important, uh, Jordan, that people know what their farmer's doing and the farmer be explained what they're doing and understand the practices and standards. Very, very important. I love that. Nobody, nobody wants to get anybody sick. That's, no, I mean, that's, absolutely that's not. evident, right? Like, and so but what, what I've found, and this is where, what I was telling you about the local dairies getting pretty passionate, uh, it all around the raw dairy is, was it, I think it was the loss of control over the product after it leaves the farm in, in, yep. in a retail operation or just the distribution, the uh, lack of the one-on-one -on -one for the customer to be able to inspect. And, and like, I get all that. I agree it, but there are so many people that live say in Little Rock where I am that are not going to take an hour and a half drive to go pick up milk, but would buy it over and over and over if it was a part of their shopping trip. And, and that, that's where I'm trying to figure out, how do we make this a win for, for everybody? <laughs> well, you're not, you don't have a shortage of good questions, I'll tell you that. Uh, Jordan, I'm telling you, that's the million dollar question. It, and, and I tell you what, you maybe have a little bit longer way to walk down the path than we have here in California, where we've always had legal raw milk in stores and they have very high standards. Uh, but Pennsylvania has the same set of standards and they have raw milk in stores as well. And so does the state of Washington, the state of Arizona, and the state of New Mexico. So it's not like it's impossible, but it is highly resisted. Uh, the powers in the raw milk lobby and the processors don't want to see that raw milk go to the farmer, to the consumer, to, to a retailer, because it pushes them out of the shelf space. And when people have a choice between raw milk that's produced well, by the way, I'm not talking about crappy milk. I'm talking about high quality right. raw milk. Yeah, it's going to cost more, but I tell you what, it outsells pasteurized. 10 to 1, done. And that's really powerful because it's great for the farmer. It's fantastic for the consumer and the retailer does well. It's a win for everyone. Um, but I, I, I'm telling you, I think that teaching raw milk and getting people's awareness up as to what their immune system is all about, the gut microbiome, uh, understanding that raw milk is the first food of life for mammals 
and it brings into the gut that doesn't have bacteria, doesn't have food at the beginning of life. It really gives you the signals of the blueprint of what life's all about in terms of the gut microbiome and the immune system. If you can learn that and you teach people about that and they say, well, I want it too. Pretty soon you're going to have your governor and half the legislators saying they want it also because it's an educational process and you, you literally got to get the moms and the kids all on board with some raw milk that's really high quality and then grow it. And that may take three years or 10 years or 15 years, but it, it's a desire to teach and grow through the humanity of compassion that it's not about you. It's about we, it's not a me project. It's a we project. Yeah. And we will do better as humanity on earth in the United States and other countries. If we start concerning ourselves with the welfare of mankind versus the dominance of how I'm going to do and screw everybody else. That doesn't work very well. Amen. Amen. I love that. But Mark, thank, thank you for your time. I, I thoroughly and I can't, I can't wait to revisit with you. I just wanted us to be able to get on and get the discussion rolling. Um, as soon as, you know, I, your, your name was recommended to me and I dove in. I thought that's a no brainer uh, because <laughs> I, I love what you're doing, and this is how we save our country. Uh, it, it, this really is. This resilient, localized food systems will, yes. will save our country. Yes. So, Mark, have a great day, my friend, and we will make sure all of the good stuff to find y'all is included. Thank you very, very much, and thanks for the, the opportunity to uh, talk with you today, buddy. Thanks a lot. Thank, thanks, my friend. See you, Mark. Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.